Hi, my name is Krunal Khatri, and in this lecture, we will continue our discussion about multiple linear regression analysis. To recap, what we know so far is multiple linear regression form and why we need it, mechanics and interpretation of the ordinary least square estimates, along with the properties and assumptions for the model, among other concepts. In this lecture, we will deep dive into multiple linear regression techniques, and there will be some overlap with the previous lecture to help us in our deep dive. And in this lecture, we will primarily focus on omitted variable bias, mechanics of variances, which will finally lead us to the Gauss-Markov theorem. This is a teaser for what is up and coming through this lecture. We will do an overview of this lecture in the next couple of slides. We'll talk about what is bias, how it applies to the omitted variables bias, then go into how omitted variables and other factors affect variances. Finally, we will go over the mechanics of the Gauss-Markov theorem to prove that ordinary least square estimates are efficient. We will also have a running example with our code to demonstrate each of these concepts. There are very few behaviors in nature and economics which can be explained by only a simple linear regression model. The classic model of a line from algebra is a simple linear regression where B is the y-intercept or beta naught and M is the slope or beta one. And the resulting model is uh, y equals mx plus b. Application of this simple model is limited because nature and economics behave in complex ways. Even something as simple as predicting the height of a person may be dependent on multiple factors, including individual's age, height of parents, nutrition, participation in sports, genetic makeup, makeup of the individual, etc. If we leave out one of these variables, as in the individual's age, then it could be the case that the model underperforms. And this causes the model being affected by an omitted variable bias. In the presence of omitted variables, one or more variables that are in the model will compensate for the omitted variable, which will cause the magnitude of those variables to be overstated by having a large estimate. Also, because of this confounding effect, of confounding effect, the variance is also lower. We will go into detail in later slides. And lastly, Gauss-Markov theorem guarantees unbiased estimates with least variance. That is efficient. What I mean by efficient? Uh, efficient is a subjective term, but we can quantify it uh, by this example. If someone can type at 500 words per minute and 300 of those words are incorrect, that is not efficient. Although if one can type at 100 words per minute and 99 of those words are correct, then that person is efficient. That is, if the model has low variability for predictions, confidence intervals, and estimates, then the model is efficient. Gauss-Markov theorem proves that parameter estimates constructed using ordinary least square method are efficient among the family of methods that generate unbiased estimates. And just a side note, on OLS method is not the only method that, that can give you unbiased estimates. There are alternative methods as well. We will go into the details of how a variable can take up effects of the omitted variable and compute the omitted variable bias. We'll talk about the variances and effects the data has on variances and how to identify unstable variances. Then we will walk through the Gauss-Markov theorem and its proof. Let's talk about what is bias. So bias is an effect that positively or negatively affects the model such that if the model is used in practice, it will lead to results that may be error prone. This bias may be because of unreliable parameter estimates if there's an omitted variable bias or multicollinearity present in the data. Bias can also occur if an incorrect sample size is selected. For example, if one is studying how good the new formula for a soft drink is, 
then you may need a much bigger sample size to represent the population that you're targeting for the new formula. On the other hand, if you have a design experiment to study the effect of a new catalyst in the production of petroleum, where you control pretty much everything, including the quantities of the catalyst and reactants, and to some effect, the environment, then you may not need a very large sample size. So bias can also occur if, if, a, if a representative sample from the behavior under study is not selected. For example, if, you, if a study is conducted to measure the effect of a new government policy and how it will affect the people in Rwanda, then you cannot survey the people from Tanzania or Uganda for that policy. Uh, you have to survey the people in Rwanda for that policy. So a representative sample is important. Uh, bias is when you add something that is not apparent from the data to the model, causing the model to drift. This may be intentionally or unintentionally, and it results in a systematic deviation from the expected value. Intentional is when you knowingly leave out data that is correlated with the response uh, as in a variable. Unintentional is when you're not aware of what are the other effects that can explain the response. In either case, and in general, we like models that have low or no bias. Let's look into the omitted variables bias. One of the biggest motivations in selecting a representative model is that we may never have the true model that explains the response, that is the why. Uh, this idea is explained by, by this quote by Dr. George Box that all models are wrong, some are useful. With this quote in our sites, we have to be sure that the model being built and recommended is indeed useful. If using theory and past experiments, then one has a strong basis to start the study. But if you're examining the behavior through trial and error, you have more chances to have an omitted variables bias. Once we have a model, then we can recommend the model if the model assumptions are satisfied, which is demonstrated by these stats. We want a low mean squared error. We want a high R squared statistic for the model. We want a, a relatively healthy standard error and T values. That is, we want T values that are in the significant range. Uh, the expected and observed signs for the estimates. By this, I mean, if you, if, you, if you get your data and you're expecting the regression sign for the particular variable to be negative, that is your expectation, that a negative value for this estimate for this variable explains the response. But when you do the, do the regression, that sign turns out to be positive. So that is unexpected. So there's something more that can be done with the data or more data needs to, be, uh, needs to be collected. So that is the expected and observed sign for signs for the estimates. Need to examine that. Then analysis of residuals is one of the most important post hoc analysis. The mean squared error is constructed from the residuals. We can also find out the influential and outlying observations in the data that affect the model for investigations and more post, post hoc analysis. If the results and the above test statistics are not satisfactory, then we must dive deeper into the model for investigation, into the data or on model specification. So why do we, why do we even care about omitted variables bias? Uh, consider a model that describes early mortality as an effect of obesity, which is a good enough assumption for a model. So if you are overweight, there are more chances of health complications and, and there's a higher chance that the person who's obese may die early. Uh, in the data set, we have people who are obese and die early. And there are also people who are not obese that die early. But this is a contradictory observation, but that is the data. And 
The people who are not obese and die early are the people who smoke, who or do some type of tobacco. So without adding the variable for smoking or tobacco use, the model will not be adequate because it will suffer from the omitted variables bias. Omitted variables bias is a model specification error and it occurs when the model is inadequate. If you are missing an important variable, then the model assumptions and stats won't be satisfied. The behavior in the study was not studied or observed long enough and the data or the data may not be available for a variety of reasons. It is just not available or it is too expensive to get the data. There are a few conditions for a model to have an omitted variable bias. If you take some random variable and add it to the regression model, this increases the R square. This does not mean that the random variable was a missing variable. The missing variable should be correlated to the response. This is also one of the assumptions for linear, linear regression. And the omitted or the new variable must be correlated with one or more explanatory variables that are already in the model. This correlation does not have to be strong because if this correlation is strong, then you may have the problem of multicollinearity. So the example data set that we will be using is in the car data package. And this package will automatically be downloaded when you install the car package. That is, if from the R terminal, when you do install.packages car, then you will get the car package and the car data package. The name of the data set is UN for United Nations and contains national statistics from the United Nations for various countries, mostly from 2009 to 2011. And the focus of this, this data set is uh, infant mortality. So uh, there are multiple variables in this data set. And these are the three variables that we will use from this data set infant mortality, fertility, and female life expectancy. Infant mortality is defined by the number of infants who survive past age one per 1,000 live births. That is, if out of 1,000 live births, 900 survive past year one, then the infant mortality rate is 100. Fertility is the total fertility rate, which is the number of children per woman. Uh, female life expectancy is how long a female is expected to survive. This may or may not be affected by child delivery. These numbers are different for different countries and we have not included the country names in our analysis. Using the country names requires a concept called dummy variables, which you will come across in another lecture. Let's think about what may happen when an important variable is omitted from the model and build some intuition to understand the omitted variable bias. We expect something to be affected on the model. And this something is the parameter estimate, which you can directly observe after doing regression. Other metrics like variance and p-values need more computation. So we can expect one of two things, an upward bias or a downward bias. Upward bias is when the parameter estimate you get as a result of doing regression is higher than the population parameter. Beta is the population parameter and beta hat is the estimate that you get after doing regression on the data. Downward bias is when the parameter estimate is much lower than the population. This is a direct result of the correlation between the omitted variable response and existing variable which is summarized in this table. That is, if, uh, if the correlation between, if we look at the column, the first column, if the correlation between the omitted variable and Y is positive, and, and at the top row, if the correlation between omitted variable and X, the X that is already in the model, 
If that is positive, then we have an upward bias. And if the correlation between omitted variable and Y is negative and correlation between omitted variable and X is negative, then we have an upward bias and other two combinations. Assuming that a true variable model explains the behavior and is the global model, this is the resulting model equation. Remember, this is just a postulate. Uh, infant mortality equals beta naught plus beta one times fertility plus beta two times female life expect expectancy plus the error term. Now, if you plot the variable, plot the variables under consideration against infant mortality and against each other, we see a strong correlation. Uh, the left two plots are against the infant mortality and the rightmost plot is against, are uh, the two variables against each other. Uh, to in induce an omitted variable bias, we have to eliminate a variable. So let's consider a model without the variable female life expectancy. Now with that variable gone, we see that there is a negative correlation between infant mortality and life expectancy, which is the leftmost plot, and the correlation between fertility and life expectancy is also negative, the rightmost plot. Now if we bring the table from previous slide back into the picture, we can postulate in what direction the bias should be. Uh, we have a negative correlation between the omitted variable, which is female life expectancy, and Y, which is infant mortality, and a negative correlation between the variable in the model, fertility, and the omitted variable. So we should expect to see an upward bias. We'll see what that means. Now, we can also see the plots to interpret if the data makes sense. So females who live longer have a low mortality rate, but we are looking at the leftmost plot. So females who live longer have a low mortality rate. If the life expectancy is 50 years, then the whole life of the individual is accelerated. And it may be that children are desired when the physical well-being of the female is not good enough to rear a child, which may lead to a higher, higher mortality rate. Uh, there are more factors here at play, like access to health services, nutrition, and other factors, which uh, may be related to a low life expectancy and thus a higher mortality rate. Uh, uh, females that have a higher number of children observe a higher mortality rate, which makes sense. Uh, if someone is unsuccessful in their previous attempt, then they may want to try again. Now we are deliberately constructing a model that has an omitted variable bias to demonstrate the concepts. Our model and response are different in this situation. Where in the previous model we had betas, this model has alphas to represent the parameters and the response is crowned with a tilde. Since we have left out the variable female life expectancy, this model is underspecified and because of our discussion from the previous two slides, we have postulated that this model has an upward bias. Because of this bias, we should expect the model to underfit and the alphas to be biased. That is, if we take out a variable from the model, we should not expect the parameters to remain the same as they were in the full model. Since, since the relationship of predictors to response is missing an, is missing an important dimension, if we increase the number of observations used to construct the alternative model, that is this model, it will still be biased. Let's look at some results for the differences between the full and the alternative models using outputs from R. We use the LM method in R to do linear regression. LM stands for linear model. What we see here on the left is analysis for the alternative model, in the center, the analysis for the full model, and on the right, some metrics for these models, namely mean squared error, MSE, and the R squared statistic. 
we can see that the estimates for the intercept and for the variable fertility are different for both models as we had claimed in the previous slide. The model where variable was omitted does have an upward bias for estimate of fertility. Upward bias means that the estimate is higher than what it should be. In the tables, 2.5% and 97.5% are the lower and upper confidence, lower and upper bounds of the 95% confidence interval. And diff is the difference, is the width of the interval. As you see, the width of intervals for both estimates is smaller in the reduced model when compared to the full model. 9.79 for the intercept and 3.16 for fertility in the reduced model and 42.31 for the intercept and 3.52 for fertility in the full model. For fertility, the difference is small when you compare both the models. Still, the interval is narrow for the reduced model, which tells us that the reduced model is more confident that the population parameter is within this interval. Now let's look at the T values. The T value for the reduced model is 23 and the full model is six. That is a drastic change in magnitude. This suggests that the reduced model is about three times more confident that, that the parameter estimate is not zero. Recall this T value is testing the hypothesis that the estimate is equal to zero. Since the uh, let's look at the standard error now. Now, since the standard error of 0 0.8 is smaller for the reduced model, the confidence interval is also small because this value is used to construct the confidence interval for parameters. Uh, if we compare this to the full model, the standard error of fertility is 0 0.89, which is why the confidence interval for the, for the full model is a little bit wider. Now, if we look at the model metrics, we clearly see that the mean squared error, the MSC, for the reduced model is much higher, suggesting a poor fit, and R square is much lower, also suggesting a poor fit. You know, uh, 226, 227 for the, for the reduced model, 90 for the full model, as far as MSC is concerned, and the R squared is also 0 0.73 for the reduced model and 0 0.89 for the full model. Uh, now, if you look at the T values, standard errors and confidence interval for the estimates, we see a contradictory picture. The parameter stats are telling us to trust the estimates, that the models are confident about the estimates, but the model metrics are telling us that the reduced model is a poor fit. Now, this discrepancy exists because of the omitted variable bias. So far, we have found out the problems that an omitted variable bias can have. Now let's look at how to identify and quantify the bias. Uh, previously, we did identify uh, and postulated that we have an upward bias. Now we can actually compute what that value is. Now, reiterating the underspecified model that we have as, re as response with tilde and alphas as the parameters. So alpha one, which is the estimate for fertility, we claim is equal to beta one hat plus beta two hat times delta tilde. Recall that we specified the full model with beta betas and the reduced model above with the alphas. So alpha one is the linear combination of beta one and beta two. Now delta tilde is a new term, new term here. And we get the estimate for delta tilde by doing a linear regression with the omitted variable as the response. In this case, female life expectancy and the same explanatory variable, which is fertility. 
in this case, it, it amounts to a simple linear regression, but this concept can be expanded to more than one variable. Also, you may not, you may not always have this omitted variable at, at your disposal. And you may have to do additional research to identify and get the data associated with that omitted variable before doing this computation. And the linear model to find delta tilde is, is highlighted in bold. Now, one of the assumptions in linear regression is that the variables are fixed and measured without error. And in this case, both the regressor and the response that is in the in, in the model female life expectancy equals delta tilde times fertility. Uh, in this case, both the regress and the response are ex explanatory variables. This is why we can consider delta tilde as fixed and not random. What this tells us is that parameter estimate in the reduced model includes the full effect of beta one because both alpha, alpha one and beta one I estimates for the same variable, fertility. But alpha one also contains a scaled estimate of beta two. The scale factor here is delta tilde. Below are the results of the summary of doing regression to find delta tilde. Uh, using the same linear model LM method in R, uh, where we can see that the estimate for delta tilde is negative 6.2243. We assume that the full model is the true relationship and the beta hats are unbiased estimators of the true population parameter betas. I've relisted the full model here. On the previous slide, the relationship between alpha one hat and beta two hat was mentioned. So here we take the expectation of both sides and use the property of uh, expectation of a sum is the sum of expectations, we end up with expectation of alpha one hat equals beta one plus beta two times delta tilde. Here, the betas are population parameters because from the full model, expected value of the unbiased beta hats is the, is the population beta. Now the bias for alpha one is just the difference between the parameter estimates from the reduced model and the actual parameter for the same variable. Notice the subscript one. Substituting for the expected value of alpha one hat and subtracting like values, this difference is beta two times delta tilde. So the bias of, in alpha one hat equals beta two times delta tilde. And this beta two times delta tilde is the omitted variable bias. From the previous slide, we have the definition of bias in terms of the betas and deltas. Now we will use this result to find the bias numerically and empirically show that this is valid. The first three bullet points are the three models. Uh, the, first full, the full model assumed to be true the reduced model and the model to find the delta tilde. From the R snippets from previous slides, we have the estimates for alpha one, beta one, beta two, and, and delta tilde. Using the equation from the previous slide to compute uh, the expected value of alpha one as beta one plus beta two times delta tilde, and comparing this result to the actual regression estimate we see that both estimates for alpha one are about the same. The numbers from the second decimal are different because of precision errors. And from this, we can also see that the bias is approximately 12.59. So omitting the variable female life expectancy from the model, we see that the estimate for fertility was inflated by about positive 2.59. And also from the table on slide seven, this indeed is a positive bias. As we have seen, omitted variables cause issues for the model with parameter estimates and other model metrics. So is there a way to potentially avoid this problem? And the answer to this question is with the quote that 
all models are wrong and some are useful. I cannot stress this quote enough uh, from Dr. George Box. The model should be formed on the basis of theory, prior work, or experimentation. When you propose a model based on experimentation, care should be taken to ensure that the relationship being described is indeed of actual significance and not just statistical significance. Now, when you have the model, it should also pass the post hoc tests that check for deviations from the assumptions of linear, linear regression and if possible, more, depending on the domain being studied. Ensuring that the model parameter estimates are indeed what is expected, uh, as in the, the science of them. And check for multicollinearity to ensure that there are no variables which are linearly dependent on each other. We'll come across, we'll follow up on, on one or two techniques uh, that are coming up. Uh, for checking multicollinearity, then checking the model on a holdout test data to ensure that the resulting model indeed captures the underlying behavior of the data. That is, the model indeed captures the average and it does not, to make sure that it does not overfit. And other metrics listed here to find out about any issues with the model or data followed by investigation to deal with any inconsistencies you know, with the model or the data. So we saw in the previous slides that the estimates are affected by the omitted, omitted variables bias. Since variances play an important part in performing hypothesis tests on the estimates and constructing confidence intervals, the effect of bias on variance should not be overlooked. Because of the assumptions of linear regression, we do have this relationship that each beta parameter is distributed normally with beta hat as the mean and CJJ times the MSE as the variance. Uh, if you recall, CJJ is the value from the X prime X inverse matrix, especially the diagonal, the diagonal part of the X prime X inverse matrix. So variances of bias estimates are also biased. And as we saw before, estimates of the reduced or biased model had a small confidence interval, much higher T values and much lower P values. Recall the OLS formula for, for linear regression, which is beta equals X prime X inverse X prime Y. How we define the expected value of beta hat estimate with the population parameter. And the value of sigma hat is estimated by the MSC. This is just a recap of the tried and tested linear regression concepts. One of the main factors that is responsible for the width of the confidence intervals is the CJJ scaling factor of the standard error. For the biased model, this CJJ factor is very small, which causes the standard error to be small as well, which in turn causes the confidence and the confidence interval to be smaller also. So with the estimates and standard errors, these are the formulae for constructing the T estimates and the confidence interval. Note the alpha over two is the value you get from the table with n minus two, n minus p degrees of freedom. We talked about CJJ. If this factor is small, then when you multiply a small number with another number, the result is scaled to be smaller. Then when you take the square root, the number, the resulting number is still small. And usually the critical value that you get from the table is not too large. For instance, with alpha equals uh, 0.05, so alpha over two is 0 0.025 and one degree of freedom, the critical value, the critical T value is 12.71. So, uh, so what I'm saying here is that uh, if you have everything to the right of the plus or minus relatively small, then the confidence interval for the estimate will be smaller. 
R can compute these values for you with specific, with specific functions like conf int and summary. But if you are so inclined to compute these manually, here it is. Everything that comes after the after the hash hashtag sign is a comment is not and is not executed by the R interpreter. If you go from the left block to the right block and from top to bottom, on the on the left block uh, from top, on the first line we see the usual uh, LM, the linear model function to do a linear regression. <coughs> there are lots of other things going on in the second line. The dim function will give you the dimensions. If your matrix or data frame has 100 rows and two columns, then dim will return a list of dimensions. And here I'm taking only the first dimension, that is uh, if there were 100 rows, I'm just taking the first dimension, which is 100, and then repeating the number one these many times. That is 100 times uh, with the rep function. So the rep function will return a list of ones, and then we are going to pass that, the list of ones, to the matrix function, which will return a column of ones, that is a vector of ones. The dollar sign is uh, in the, if you look, uh, if you look across the code, you will see like dollar signs. So the dollar sign is used to extract the variable, the variables that are in the object returned by LM or any other complex structure. You can access individual columns of a data frame with the name of the data frame. In this case, uh, it would be UN, and then the dollar sign, and then the column name. So the third line from third line from the object partial fit, we are accessing the variable model, which is the data frame. And then from this data frame, we are extracting the variable fertility. And we are column binding the vector of ones with the, with the column values in fertility into the variable capital X, capital X. Then we are constructing the, like in the second code block or still on the left, we are constructing the mean squared error, the X prime X inverse matrix, then the standard errors. Here, the multiplication sign, sign between, uh, when we do, when we construct the X prime X inverse, the multiplication sign between percentages is telling the R interpreter to do a matrix multiplication. Here uh, and in the in the square in the standard error, uh, the diag function will give the values on the diagonal in in whatever matrix you you give it. In this case, the x prime x inverse matrix. Now and these are the CJJs. The multiplication symbol here when constructing standard errors does a scalar multiplication. That is uh, MSE from above will be multiplied with each and every element uh, of the left-hand side. So in this case, uh, each and every value of the diagonal will be multiplied with MAC. But if you don't give a diagonal, if you just give it the X prime X inverse matrix, it'll multiply each and every element of the X prime X inverse matrix with the MSC. Now, uh, below that is a, is a QT function. Uh, this is the function to get the T values given the probability and the degrees of freedom. For alpha equals 0 0.05, and to construct the confidence intervals, uh, we have to give the probability as 0 0.025 for the two-sided, uh, uh, for the two-sided, uh, for a two-sided interval, and uh, 193 minus two are the degrees of freedom. So 193 are the number of rows, um, and two are the estimates that we are that we are that we are constructing in the linear regression.
So QT by default will give you the lower tail values. That is on the negative, that is the negative values, which is why on the right hand side, top, when I construct the confidence interval manually, the lower and higher are reversed. Because uh, I did not, because it just occurred to me that the T naught in the lower, the T naught uh, partial fit, partial dot fit dollar sign coefficients minus T naught times standard error, like the T naught is actually negative. So, so lower is actually higher and higher is actually lower. So you could do all of this code to construct the confidence intervals or use the built-in R function confint to get the confidence interval, which I have done on the right-hand side block, the lowermost, the lowermost, uh, the low, lowermost output. I've used the, the function confint and, to, and I've just given it partial dot fit, the object that I get from doing linear, from doing linear regression and I get the, so in that, in this case, I don't have to worry about uh, uh, the, the signs of uh, the signs of the T knots or anything. Uh, it, it just gives you the, the appropriate confidence interval for the estimates that are in this partial dot fit. So, here we, here we see the uses of variance from constructing the T values to confidence intervals manually and through the R function. Now the choice is yours on which method you want to use for your own research and implementation. But I would suggest use the functions that R gives you by default. As we, as we have seen, variances are used in multiple areas of computations for instance, constructing the confidence interval for the mean, prediction, and parameters. Along with these, variances also play an important role in identifying problems like multicollinearity in the model. One of the metrics that will throw a, fl throw a flag is the variance inflation factor, or VIF. Now, as you see in the formula, VIF is the inverse of one minus correlation between the two variables, between two variables squared, and it also scales the variance of an estimate. Recall that the correlation coefficient measures if two variables or regressors are linearly dependent. That is, if one moves up, then the other moves down, and other combinations of up and down, and the correlation coefficient ranges between negative one and one. So the square of a negative number is a positive number and the denominator is always positive. And consequently, VIF is also a positive number and has a range from one to positive infinity. Uh, during the regression, you do not want to have two regressors that are strongly correlated with each other because having strongly correlated variables will lead to an unstable model and this should not be the reason to remove one of the correlated variables. Because if both these correlated variables are also correlated with the response, then you will have a omitted variables bias. So one way is to combine these two correlated variables into one to mitigate the problem of multicollinearity and also the problem of omitted variables bias. Uh, a rule of thumb is that if BIF exceeds five or 10, then there's an indication that the model is affected by multicollinearity. And fortunately, there's a VIF function in the car package that will compute the VIF for you. Now, let's get into some theoretical aspects to confirm what we talked about unbiased estimates and variances is actually true and how using the Gauss-Markov theorem. To recap why we fit a linear regression model, it is to find the best line, plane, or hyperplane, you know, depending if you have one, two, or multiple regressors, that best 
fits the data to explain and or predict the response. So what do we mean by best? There are multiple ways to fit a linear regression model using ordinary least square and other optimization method, optimization and algorithmic methods. And the Gauss-Markov theorem provides us with a right, objective criteria to examine the estimates and variances that we get from the OLS method against other methods. It does this by establishing a framework that proves the parameter estimates generated using the OLS methods are indeed the best. To appreciate how and why the Gauss-Markov theorem proves that the estimates are efficient with least variance, we begin by revisiting the assumptions for linear regression. The model is linear, so this model here is, is linear in the parameters, which means this includes the family of linear, quadratic, and other power for the regressors. The ex, uh, keep in mind, the exponents are on the regressors and not the parameters. The models may have interaction terms as well. Some of the, the, the uh, to recap, the assumptions are, uh, the responses are normally, are randomly sampled from a population where each observation has an equal likelihood of being selected. The X's are independent and fixed. Recall multicollinearity. We do not want effects that confound with each other. Uh, the expected value of errors given the predictors is zero, or in short, the expected value of errors is zero. The variance is constant. Uh, there are no serial correlation between errors. Uh, and the last three bullets boil down to the errors being normally distributed with mean of zero and constant variance. Now, these are the same assumptions that, uh, that, that, that you would have uh, seen in the previous lecture as well, because these are the universal, uh, pretty much the universal assumptions that you have to satisfy with post hoc tests after doing linear regression. Now, let's look at what are blue estimates and get an intuition about them. So blue stands for best linear unbiased estimators. Unbiased means that with repeated sampling, the OLS parameters will be close to the population estimates, or in other words, 95% of the time, the confidence interval will contain the population parameter. As we have seen before, beta hats are assumed to be normally distributed. Consistency implies that with increased number of observations, the model estimates will be very close to the population estimate. In the picture, you see that both curves are centered at the population beta. So even with n equals 100 or n equals 1000, the, pop, the estimates are consistent around the population beta. OLS estimates are efficient. So the plot shows the variance of beta hat and variance of beta tilde, which is constructed using an alternate method centered at the population estimate. If you remember, we assume a constant variance. So we expect the magnitude of variances to be the same on either side of the estimate. So the plot shows that estimates constructed using ordinary least squares, that is beta hat, have much more small, have much smaller variance than beta tilde constructed using another method. The two plots on the right seem similar, but one plot is looking at the spread of variance, which is the leftmost plot, and the other is looking at consistency as n is increased which is the middle plot. To work with the Gauss-Markov theorem and prove the, prove the blue best linear unbiased estimates, let's revisit the OLS, estimates, OLS estimation using matrix notation. Because using matrix math is the most general method 
that can be applied to simple and multiple linear regressions. And regression is implemented in all software packages using matrix algebra. So we have the model y equals uh, x beta plus epsilon for n observations and p parameters. Y is a column vector with dimensions n rows and one column. So y is a column vector. Uh, n x is a n times p matrix with n rows and p columns. P stands for the number of parameters being estimated. For example, in simple in linear regression, we are estimating two parameters, one intercept and the other is the slope. In general, P is the number of explanatory variables mm -hmm. plus one. Beta is another column vector with P rows and one column because we are estimating P parameters. And epsilon is another column vector with dimensions n by one. So with this formulation, we have the tried and tested uh, uh, formula for, for beta hats. These estimates are linear functions of the linear function of the response because it has the it has a response included in x prime x inverse x prime y. Now we take the y from above and substitute into, the, into this formula. And resulting, we get this equation. Now distributing x prime x uh, inverse times x prime, we get this complicated looking equation. But if you look closely, x prime x inverse times x prime x results in an identity matrix. So we can ignore the identity identity matrix and rewrite the equation as such. Just beta plus x prime x inverse times x prime times epsilon. Now, when we take the expectation of both sides, you know, based on the assumptions from the previous slide, x's are fixed and expectation of a fixed value is the, is the value itself, which is why the x computations are not included in the expectation. Also, if you recall from the previous slide, beta and epsilon are assumed to be normally distributed and thus are random variables. So the expectations of those, we can take the expectation of those. Therefore, we have assumed that expected value of epsilon equals zero and anything multiplied with zero is zero. So the whole computation with the X matrices, X matrices is reduced to zero. And we have this resulting equation. So now we have the expected value of beta hats is beta. And this is the definition of unbiased estimates. With the same linear model as the previous slide, we now have a new formulation with added weights. And here, the estimates are called beta tilde. Beta tilde is still a linear combination of Y and C is the matrix with dimensions P, P by N of constant weights. We do the same substitution as in the previous slide for Y and distribute and we get this another complicated looking equation. We could exploit the fact that an inverse matrix and the original matrix equals, equals an identity in the first term. So this complicated, complicated looking equation reduces again. Now let's take the expectation of both sides and walk through this. Uh, since beta is a random variable, its, expect, its expectation is something, so we keep it. Next, we have the X computation multiplied with the expectation of zero, uh, expectation of errors, which is zero, and this part is reduced to zero. Again, we have a computation with the expected value of beta, so this remains. And the last part is uh, C times the expected value of, of errors. So this also reduces to zero. 
now we are left with an equation that tells us that the expectation of uh, beta tilde is biased. So it's no longer just expectation of beta tilde equals beta, but it's expectation of beta tilde plus some constant matrix C times the original, the original X matrix times beta. So it's, that's why it's biased. So to get unbiased, uh, unbiased beta tilde, Cx should be equal to zero. In other words, C has to be orthogonal to X so that their product is zero and we are left with expected value of beta tilde equals beta. So why did we go through these computations? We went through these computations so that we have a baseline for working through the computations of the Gauss-Markov theorem. In the previous two slides, we proved that OLS estimates are unbiased and we got a mechanism to get unbiased estimates when constants exist. In this slide and the next two slides, we will prove that only the estimates constructed using OLS methods have the lowest variance. That is uh, without any added constants. So we will start with the same formula for beta tilde computation, and we will take the variance of both sides. Now variances have this property where if you take the variance of a constant times the random variable, then we have to take the square of the constant and multiply it by the variance of the random variable. This constant happens to be a matrix, which is composed of x prime x inverse plus c. One way to intuitively think about why we square the constant is, since variances are non-negative numbers, we square the constant so that the resulting variance is positive or non-negative. Now to make it look manageable, we let A be the we let A be this complicated matrix, and now we have something that looks good. But we still have to do, we still have to substitute for A to do computations on A prime. When we distribute the transpose operator on A prime into its components inside, we get this equation for the variance of beta tilde. Now let's look at the variance of Y. One of the assumptions we have for the variance of the regression model is that it is constant. We have used MSE for much of this, much of the computations to compute standard error and confidence interval for estimates and predictions. So I encourage you to work through the dimensions and to satisfy yourself that this, mat that this matrix math works. To motivate this, to motivate this effort, uh, we have X matrix with dimensions N by P, the C matrix with dimensions P by N. And when we apply the transpose operation, we swap the rows and columns. So X prime has dimensions P by N and C prime has dimensions N by P. And the variance of beta tilde has dimensions P by P. So to get this result, the identity matrix has dimensions n by n. So substituting the variance for y into the equation for variance of beta tilde, we will rewrite it as this. You know, the x prime x inverse times x prime plus c, the quantity times uh, sigma squared times identity, and that quantity times the quantity x times x prime x inverse plus C prime. Now, since this variance is a constant number, we can multiply it in any position. So we'll bring it to the left-hand side and cross multiply terms in the A and A prime matrices. In these cross multiply terms, we can use information from, from what we know and exploit some properties of transpose and identity and inverse matrices to reduce the number of terms we have. Namely, uh, when we got the, got the estimates for beta tilde, we assumed 
the, ma the matrix C times X equals zero. So we'll be consistent uh, and C times X equals zero over here as well. And, we, and to exploit the properties of uh, the transpose, we have X prime times C prime. We can rewrite that as uh, C times X, the quantity primed or the quantity transposed. Now, since C times X equals zero, we have a uh, zero transpose, which is still zero. Also for an inverse matrix times the original matrix equals the identity matrix. Uh, with this information uh, of zeros and identities, uh, this reduces our equation for variance of beta tilde to this. Now C prime, C times C prime is one way to square numbers in a, in a matrix or a vector. And C times C prime is a positive semi-definite matrix, which is a mathematical way of saying that every element in the matrix is greater than or equal to zero. So with this result, we have here the variance of beta tilde. And when we compare it against the variance of OLS estimates without the added bias of uh, constant matrices, we can clearly say, see that the variance of beta tilde has the added constants and beta tilde does not. Now, since uh, C prime C is a non-negative matrix, we have the result that the variance of beta tilde is greater than or equal to the variance of beta hat. So here we conclude our proof of the Gauss-Markov theorem that OLS estimates are unbiased and efficient because they have the lowest variance. Let's put the theorem to test using a simple example with an intercept only model with uncorrelated errors having zero mean and constant variance. Our model equation is y equals beta naught plus errors. And our pred predictor is a vector of ones. Remember, this is an intercept only model. So the only variable we have is the vector of ones. So the best linear unbiased estimator, blue, that is beta hat, is the sum of y's over the number, number of observations or y bar. And the variance of the estimate is sigma squared over n. We do not care what the estimate of variance is, and we do not want to worry about the variance computation, which is why I have left the sigma squared as is. Now consider the alternative estimator beta tilde, where we have an added vector of C. So according to what we saw before in the theorem, beta tilde is unbiased if the sum of, if the sum of this C vector is equal to zero. And from the theorem, we have the variance of beta tilde includes the constants squared. Now, when you compare the variance of beta tilde and beta hat, the variance of beta tilde is greater than the greater than or equal to beta hat. So the variance of beta tilde is the variance of beta hat plus sigma squared times sum of um, times the sum of c's. If you distribute the sigma squared through through the parentheses. Uh, now let's put this example into R. So here I set the seed and create my data for X, Y, and C. You should set the seed for reprodu reproducibility of your results. In this case, if you recreate the data set with the seed of zero, you will get identical results as on this slide. Here, the R norm function with just one number in the case of uh, when we generate Y, and in this case, 10 will return uh, random values from the, normal, from the normal distribution with zero mean and unit standard deviation. I'm not sure why it takes the standard deviation in R, but the relationship between variance and standard deviation is the difference of the value being 
the variance is, is in squared units and the standard deviation is in the original units if you take the square root of the variance. But if you explicitly give the values for mean and standard deviation, it will produce values with the given mean and variance, which I have done here for C. So the values in C have zero mean and 0 0.1 standard deviation. Here, I have used the regression formula for, for beta hat of x prime x inverse uh, times x prime y. Uh, you can use the sum of sum of y's over number of observations, in this case 10, and get a similar value for beta hat. So in the computations, uh, the function t is for transpose. The function solve will return an inverse matrix and the multiplication sign between two percent signs is for matrix multiplication. After the computation, uh, B underscore hat is a matrix with dimensions uh, one row, one column, which is one, one, which is why in the print statement, I have indexed uh, B underscore hat with one, one in square brackets. And the paste function will concatenate the comma separated arguments um, each, the comma separated arguments that you give it and will construct a string that the print statement will display. So so here in the in the paste function, there are there are two argue, there are two arguments here. The string uh, estimate for beta dash hat equals comma and the parameter estimate. Uh, which is just one value, uh, beta hat one one. Uh, because the C's are from a from a ra from a random normal distribution with zero mean and a very small variance, each value in this vector is very small, and when summed up, it's very close to zero. For simplicity's sake, let's assume the the sum of these values in C is indeed zero. And with this, we have the unbiased estimate for beta hat and beta tilde of uh, 0 0.3589. Now with this estimate, we construct, our, we construct our Y predictions, compute our errors and MSC, MS, MSE, the mean squared error or the variance and get the variance of beta hat. This turns out to be 0 0.1453. Now, when we compute the variance for the estimate beta tilde, it is 0 0.2246, which is much bigger than the variance for beta hat. Uh, we, have used this, we have used this formula for, uh, for variance of beta tilde from, from the previous slide. Now, remember the values in the vector C have a very small standard deviation and are small. So even with this, uh, these small values, the variance incre increases quite a bit. So this is an empirical example of the Gauss-Markov theorem to prove empirically that the OLS estimates are unbiased and efficient. So the key takeaways from this lecture are that to avoid the problem of uh, omitted variables bias, the study of behaviors uh, under study should be good and possibly thorough. When possible, use ordinary least squares method because of its efficiency. Test assumptions before claiming a model. This is one of the main factors that can make or break your model and help guide research in a meaningful direction. I'll end with uh, this, uh, picture, this picture and quote from Dr. George Box. Uh, he was a very influential statistician and you will see this quote every now and then. We may never know the underlying factors that affect an outcome, but carefully choosing the variables that go into creating the model can lead us to a useful model. And this concludes the lecture.
Thank you very much.